Welcome to another episode of The Candid Savage. This is episode number seven with myself, Ashley Mitz here. And today we're covering a topic of depression, which can be pretty hard for people to talk about, people to understand, and maybe you haven't gone through it. Maybe you are, um, but maybe you also have people in your life that are going through depression, anxiety, and don't know how to quite handle them or talk to them or handle situations that are necessarily really hard. And coming from someone as myself who's battled depression and anxiety, I think it's very important uh, for everyone to understand how depression works, um, how to deal with someone that is going through depression and anxiety. So I brought on Mandy Robertson, who's a registered psychotherapist with the College of Registered uh, Psych- Psychotherapists of Ontario and a certified Canadian counselor with the Canadian Counseling of Psychotherapy Association. She has a background in counseling individuals who've experienced personal and interpersonal difficulties or crisis. Um, so I want to welcome Mandy onto the Candid Sav to talk about this lovely topic. Thanks, Ashley. I'm excited to talk about it. <laughs> so why don't we start off by um, just introducing yourself to the listeners, kind of mm-hmm. let them know where you come from and um, yeah, how you kind of manage your, your practice and, and deal with individuals. Okay. Um, So like you said, I'm a registered psychotherapist. I've been in private practice for about uh, just coming up on two years, I guess now. Um, Before that, I was a counselor um, working with individuals mainly uh, for about seven years previous to that. So almost 10 years I've been in practice. Um, And uh, yeah, just working with uh, individuals and couples on a variety of things, but depression and anxiety are probably the main ones that we hear almost all the time, right? Even if people Mm -hmm. are coming in for relationship issues, that maybe there's some anxiety around that or, you know, relationship issues that have been uh, maybe exacerbated by depression or anxiety. So I feel like those are two really huge um, mental health issues that we see a lot in our private practice um, and in my practice before that as well. So do you see, because I know now, especially in Canada where we are, we have very limited daylight. Mm-hmm. So do you see kind of like, I don't want to say like a boost in your clientele, but do you see kind of like a growing concern of depression in the wintertime here? Definitely. And actually, um, there's been stats done that November tends to be one of the um, busiest months that people will reach out um, for therapy and help. And I think that pretty well coincides with when the time changes and it's getting darker and people are starting to maybe feel that, that set in. Um, so definitely there is, there is a boost when it starts to get, the days get shorter, it gets darker, it gets colder. And yeah. We see that a lot. I know for, like for me personally, like I'm a Canadian, it gets cold. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it sucks a little bit. And then we have the lack of day, like it's four o'clock and it's dark here. Yeah. Um, and you get up and it's dark. Yeah. I, I know how to handle myself and I know a lot of people don't know how to handle it or maybe not even necessarily know that they're um, either they have seasonal depression or not understanding that the lack of daylight, the cold weather and probably change in diet as well mm-hmm. is hampering their mental health. So what are some, I guess, tips and tricks I guess we can kind of share with people to help them with starting off with a seasonal depression. What kind of things would you recommend that people do? Yeah. So um, with uh, it's the official term seasonal affective disorder, sad, it's aptly named <laughs> yeah, <seriously>. um, <laughs> with, uh, with seasonal affective disorder. One of the things is, I mean, we are in Canada, we have limited light, but one of the things that's recommended is trying to get as much, light as you can. So if you're able to, you know, during your workday, pop out for a quick walk on your break or um, in the morning, if you have pets and they're walking, you know, trying to get as much light as you can. Um, There is these devices called light boxes that you can purchase and kind of sit in front of. Ask you about that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can get those. Um, and they say using those for an hour every morning has been shown to be helpful, but not everyone wants to purchase a light box and have that. So if you can get out and get some natural light, um, in the, in the few hours that are available, that's, that's one thing that can really help. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's the chemicals of it, right? The serotonin and that sort of thing is what kind of plays into 
lower mood, feeling a bit more tired, low energy, that sort of thing. So that's, that's a big one. Yeah, I know for me, I tan, I swear to God, four times a year. <laughs> and it's always in the wintertime, so I want to feel warm. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, even going into a tanning bed for even five minutes, um, mm-hmm. I'm not a huge advocate of tanning. Um, but, you know, I like to feel warm. And it wouldn't hurt to not look like Casper. Yeah. So being in a bed once in a while is awesome for me. But I do feel not rejuvenated, but a little bit better after having that, that time in the tanning bed. Yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely light is a huge one. Yeah. And another big one is diet and exercise. Like you said, you know, we do tend to, when it gets cold, we do tend to eat a little bit worse, right? We have a comfort food. Yeah. We just snuggle up and just eat some bread. <laughs> you know, like, it, it, you know, I think it's just a, it just makes us feel cozy. So we do it. Um, but so that, that's more of a, a, a conscious thing to be aware of what we're eating and, and to still try and get out and do that exercise with the, you know, the shorter days, people who'd normally maybe go out for a run after work, they aren't doing that as much. Mm -hmm. So maybe trying to figure out, are there different things that I can do? Maybe I'm not going out for a run because it's dark out, but maybe there's something else that I can be doing um, to still get in that little bit of exercise because that's going to boost your energy. It's going to make you feel better overall. Uh, So that's another really important thing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if you already have those habits set in place um, when it's not winter to try and keep hold of those and and if you don't to try and establish them see now i did not tell her to tell you guys to work out this is not a paid advertisement (laughs) so i'm gonna just say that i agree that working (laughs) eating a healthy diet is a good thing Mm -hmm. again i did not pay her to say any of this no so for those of you that are in a routine in the summertime of of running uh maybe going to your cottage and being outdoorsy even though you don't have that cottage in the wintertime, you can still take the activity indoors. Right. Even joining like, like we have community gyms here that offer different sports, mm-hmm. um, a pool, going to a gym, not being biased to my own. Um, but you know, going to a gym, getting active, getting your endorphins going. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Stuff like that. And staying on track is definitely something I preach to my people. Yeah. Which I think is great. Even for me, like I'll have a shitty day and then I'm like, I'm going to go to my squat rack and I'm going to deadlift and I'm going to feel fantastic. Yeah, I do. I lift things and I feel great. For sure. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I think of myself and, and sometimes in the winter, it is harder to keep on that, that schedule. Um, My husband and I, we joined a dodgeball league um, several years back in the winter time. Right. And it's kind of, it, it was social interaction, which is also good for, you know, if you're feeling depressed, sometimes we tend to isolate and we don't want to see anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, So sometimes even going to the gym alone can, can feel kind of crappy. So if you're able to maybe join some sort of team, um, team sport, right. So we did dodgeball and it was cold getting out there, but once we got there, you had fun, it's a bit of exercise, you, you interact um, and you just overall feel good about it afterwards. So there's, there's stuff like that that you can look into and try. I fully advocate dodgeball. <laughs> it gets intense. It gets intense. Every time someone mentions dodgeball, I think a Zoolander. <laughs> I don't know why it just happens. Yeah. Um, but that's an interesting fact that you just mentioned about not being dodgeball, but I love dodgeball. But, you know, having a sport or um, a team kind of atmosphere away from your workplace. Mm-hmm. And there is, mm-hmm. like, I can talk about my own story, which people listening probably already know my story about leaving the government. Um, what would save me was sport mm. and in particular mine was martial arts and getting into a different group and a different crowd and a different atmosphere helped my head. Mm-hmm. Maybe not when I took a punch in the head, but yeah. <laughs> realistically speaking, getting out of my environment was fantastic uh, for me. So what would you say to people? Like I know for me, I tell people, if you hate your job, figure out what you love and just quit and go do what you love. Yeah. Again, could be biased. I did that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also not normal compared to a lot of people. I just have zero fuckery in my head. But what would you tell people that have a job that they've been in for years and years and years Mm -hmm. are extremely unhappy. They come see you because that's like one of the number one things that makes them super depressed. Yeah. What would be something you would tell people that are hating their career right now? Yeah. And it's such a hard thing because I know how scary it is to go from, especially living in a government town, there's that Mm -hmm. security and stability, right? So if you're in a job and you know, you're saying there's a lot of barriers to leaving sometimes, right? Even if it is really, really making you feel awful. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, I don't think it's a, um, 
always as simple as, as, you know, just do it. I think you got to work through the fear, first of all. So if there's yeah. fears, they're valid. Um, give them some room to be heard and to talk through those fears. Um, but know that that risk taking, you know, if you decide to do it, there's going to be some, there's going to be risk, there's going to be fear. So there's, there's no real taking that leap and hoping I'll do it when I no longer feel afraid or I'll do it when mm -hmm. I no longer, or when I know for sure it's going to work because there's always, there's always risk when we do something new or, or try something different. Um, so I would say, you know, let the fear have its voice and be heard and validated, but, but also acknowledge that um, it doesn't need to, to hold you hostage in a sense, you know, it doesn't yeah. need to keep you um, where you are, that you can do something different with fear yeah. and it can still be a good thing. Yeah. And I know for me, when I, like, I don't follow rules ever unless I drive and even then let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I didn't follow any rules. When I quit, I didn't have, you know, someone like you uh, to talk to. I felt because of what I went through, I was, I guess, kind of pushed in a corner in a way. Um, so I was like, fuck it at two in the morning on a Thursday, went on a road trip for two weeks okay. and ended up in New Brunswick like twice. Like it was stupid. Yeah. But um, I didn't have someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, I had to figure it out on, as I went along, but eventually found someone to talk to. And something I talk about in my book is getting help Okay. Yeah. and no one should be afraid of asking for help. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think, you know, it's something we could probably touch on is a lot of people are fearful of picking up the phone and making an appointment with someone like yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or even speaking to their spouse because they feel like they're less than. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, people that are struggling with that right now with the, the picking up the phone, like they see the phone, they know they need help, but they're too afraid to pick up the phone. What's something that we can share with them to just get them to pick up the phone? Yeah. Yeah. And I know it's, it's so hard because it requires a ton of vulnerability to say, I need help. I, I've been trying, I'm struggling. Right. And that, even if you're not saying those words to, to talk to somebody or to pick up the phone it's sort of implying that, right? Like I'm struggling and mm -hmm. that can be really hard to even admit to yourself. Um, but I would say that, you know, again, with the fear, right? There's that fear of the unknown, you know, what's this person going to think of me? What's this person going to say? Um, and to, to just think of it as, you know, to pick up the phone, to make that call, even to talk to your spouse, right? You might feel like it's, it's, weakness. I have heard some people say it feels like weakness to ask for help. It's mm -hmm. actually so courageous, right? Because you're, you might be feeling that, that fear, that uncertainty, but you're doing it anyways. And so from my perspective, you're, you're very brave, right? I, well, every client that walks into my office, I, I am in awe of their courage to come in mm -hmm. and, you know, to talk to me and tell me their story. And that takes guts. And that's, you know, it's not, it's not an easy thing. Um, so to almost look at it as, um, I'm not less than, I'm not weak for asking for help. I'm actually really, really strong and brave for taking this step um, mm -hmm. and doing it despite maybe the, the uncertainty or the fear that I have around it. Yeah. I think that's, that's huge. Cause like even in everyday life, like sometimes we feel a certain emotion, but we yeah. can't say it. Yeah. Because yeah. there's like that hidden fear of like yeah. you know, telling someone that you care about them um, or even something like when your spouse is like, does this make me look fat? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, but in real life, you're like, no, you look great. Yeah. Know, there's always a fear of something. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I think one of the others we should touch on, because we see it all the time, whether it's like in line today, it was at UPS mm -hmm. and there's probably about four of us waiting there because they just opened their doors this guy in front of me took every ounce of me not to say something to this guy, but he was agitated because the guy behind the counter um, was having technical issues with his computer. Like computer shut off on him, the handheld thing scanning his package just shut off on him. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like the technology devil was in the room just annihilating everything that worked. <laughs> so he's having to do everything manual. Meanwhile, this guy's getting pissed. How if like, for all I know, this guy has depression. I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. He probably doesn't. Maybe he does. Mm -hmm. But with people right now having issues, maybe they're not getting help or maybe they are. 
having issues with outbursts or, you know, someone looks at you in the, in the office and then you immediately clam up in anxiety. Like you, you create this story in your head mm-hmm. of they mm-hmm. did something, but really they just walked by and looked out the window. Mm-hmm. How, what are some steps that we can help people maybe not have the outbursts or not have those thoughts in their head that everyone's watching them? Um, what are some steps that you would be able to give a client? Yeah. So that's a big one. Um, Huge. Sorry. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I may not have a simple, simple answer for it there. I, Cause I think there's a lot of, a lot of factors that, that go into that. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I like that you said, you know, the story that I, that I make up, I, I like to take that approach a lot. Right. Is when, when we have a reaction to something, um, it can be helpful to look inward and say, what's the story that I'm making up about this? Um, I don't know if you've heard of Brene Brown, um, but she's a researcher and she talks a lot about uh, shame, vulnerability, and it's all, all this, um, this internal turmoil that we go through. And she talks about being honest with the story we're making up. So that person just walked by and looked at the window, but I'm making up that they they were somehow trying to intimidate me or I am making up that they had some sort of insult that they were, Mm -hmm. you know, implicitly sending my way. And, and that's, what's fueling my reaction to that. Right. So that's not necessarily the truth, right? Mm -hmm. That's just the story I make up about what just happened there. Right. The, The guy in the UPS store, he's getting upset at, you know, the employee, he's maybe making up a story that this guy is just, you know, trying to ruin my day. This guy doesn't care about where I need to be in the next half hour. Yep. And that's fueling his anger, right? Towards him and, he's, and it's building, it's building, it's blowing up. So I would say for people that are experiencing that, that blow up within themselves to look inward really and, and kind of notice what's the script that's running through my head. What, what's, what's playing there? What am I telling myself? What are the stories that I'm making up about what I'm seeing around me or in the people that I'm with. Um, And, you know, are those fair? Are those accurate? Mm -hmm. Um, Are those really benefiting me, those stories that I make up? Or is it just always putting me in this defensive, angry position, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So that would be a a big thing, I think, um, in terms of of that. Another thing with with outbursts, specifically with anger, is I, I... believe um for a lot of people not everybody but under anger sometimes is a lot of pain um and so sometimes you can again going inward asking yourself okay i'm feeling really angry right now if i dig a little bit underneath that anger what hurts right and and where is there is there pain here is there um you know is there sadness here perhaps right and not all the time i mean sometimes anger is just anger but you know when it's sort of blowing up at the UPS guy, you know, maybe there's something more to that. Right. Yeah. Um, and trying to, and that, and this is all stuff that maybe talking to a therapist could be helpful for, because sometimes it's hard to, to dig through that stuff on your own. Right. And sometimes yeah. you need an outside perspective to come and say, Hmm, well, do you see a link between this and that? Or what do you think about this? And they can sometimes point out those blind spots that we have in ourselves mm-hmm. that maybe we didn't notice. Yeah. And I know that a lot of people that I speak with are always afraid. So when they do that thought pattern, Mm -hmm. they know they can find that they maybe have found the trigger or they can't find out. They know there's one there and they're always really afraid to go to someone like you and say, Hey, I'm having these problems. I'm thinking it might stem from when I was a child Mm -hmm. and say it was like abused by someone. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to go through. Like I know for myself, my own personal story, like, even your husband doesn't even know about this, but uh, there was stuff that I went through as a kid that I didn't realize till maybe five years ago that it was, it actually impacted how I reacted as a kid and then up into my teens and into my twenties. Um, but it wasn't until I quit my career and was like freed of all this shit mm-hmm. that I realized, holy fuck, those years when this happened, that affected me more than I thought, Yeah, which has ultimately made me a stronger person. Yeah. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I really think people should really look at people like you as, as help and not as intimidating because mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. it's super powerful. For sure. And 
for those of you who are listening who are maybe battling something inside, I really want you to just be strong and pick up that phone. And even if it's one appointment, it's better than none. Mm -hmm. And people like Mandy are not judging you yeah, in any way. And I think that's something that's super important to be heard. Cause I know for like someone like me or like other people, that was a fear is like, am I going to be judged going in here or, mm-hmm. you know, going to the waiting room, mm-hmm. like sitting in that office in the waiting room. And there's like two people beside you. And it's like, do they think I'm crazy for sitting here? <laughs> but they're there too. Right. <laughs> so I don't know. I think it's like getting past that fear too. of just sitting in the goddamn waiting room. Yeah. yeah. Um, is another one. Yeah. There's so many, so many fears. Yeah. Um, well, I like to compare it to, to physical health, right? You know, if you, if you, had some sort of wound, let's say physically you, you had a gash in your arm, you know, you would, you would pick up the phone, you'd go to the doctor, you would get it figured out. You would, you know, you would realize this is bigger than me. I can't do this on my own. I need some extra help here. It's gotta be done. I mean, mental health is the same sort of thing. We just can't see it as clearly as a gash on your arm, Mm -hmm. but there's this idea that, no, I have to be able to figure it out on my own. If I go and ask someone for help, people are going to look at me and think, well, what's wrong with you that you can't do this by yourself, but it's the same thing, right? It's the same thing as, as if we were to sustain some sort of physical injury. Um, And I'm trying to, you know, have people look at it that way that it's not, there's not really any difference. It's just one can be visibly seen and the other cannot for the most part. That's huge. It's him with like PTSD. Mm -hmm. Um, That's another huge one. Some people don't understand why someone reacted to like a tree branch but yeah. for them, they're thinking of the tree branch as something completely different. Yeah. And they yeah. freak out. Yeah. Um, with all the things that we just talked about, the topics, workplace being like with themselves, but also the depression bleeding into relationships, mm-hmm. um, personal relationships with people, creating stories of their spouse cheating because they saw, I don't know, someone liking a status on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, social media can be great. Mm-hmm. I'm like I love social media because it's great for me for my for my business. But yeah, yeah. social media also can be a huge bitch, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. It, from like cyberbullying, but also to what we're talking about, like depression. Like you can have a spouse who's going through depression all of a sudden seeing the like on Susie's post and thinking they're cheating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How, have you had instances like that with with people like just kind of in their head? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, it, it goes back to the the stories we make up, right? And and sometimes if you're feeling, if you're already feeling low or you know just unhappy, depressed, then you're you're almost looking for things to confirm that feeling in a sense, right? So you're feeling low, so you look and you see that like, and you're like, see, there it is, you know, it's cheating on me, that you know, and it just sends you deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and and yeah, it's not it's not uncommon. It, it's it's something we do all the time. So it's more than others, but definitely I don't think there's anybody that hasn't done that at some point. Um, and it's, yeah. And it's hard to sort of, to catch yourself in that, right. And just notice when, when you're doing that and, and when it's becoming an issue. I mean, sometimes we can do it and we work through it's Mm -hmm. fine, but other times if it's continuing, especially in relationships, it can really become quite a, quite a difficult issue and can really impact that relationship in a negative way. Mm-hmm. Like being self-aware is is definitely well. I think everyone should be self-aware all the time, mm-hmm. but um, especially when you're dealing with anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I wanted to ask some questions from viewers. Okay. Yeah. And <clears throat> one of the I won't mention the name. One of them was, "What are the two top things to do when you have to battle with your brain every day?" So this is someone that's having issues kind of getting out of bed to go to work and then coming home binge eating because they feel bad about life. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would say, I mean, not, no, it could be different for everyone depending on what that battle looks like and sounds like. Um, But on a more general level from people that I've worked with and I've kind of witnessed that battle, I would say, the two top things, maybe one would be self-compassion. Um, and these are going to sound really simple in theory. They're extremely difficult to put into practice, but yeah. self-compassion um, can be huge in terms of starting to break that cycle of negativity. You know, if you're, if you're 
um, waking up and you're right off the bat being hard on yourself for feeling like you don't want to go to work and then you come home and you binge eat and then you rip yourself a new one because you're, you just yeah. binge it. Right. And you know, if you're being hard on yourself, that's continuing that, that pattern. Right. Whereas if you can throw in a little bit of self-compassion, when I say self-compassion, it's not to say that you're, um, letting yourself off the hook necessarily. Self-compassion is about recognizing that you're human, um, that you're not alone in this sort of struggle. Um, and that, you know, you deserve the kindness that you would give to somebody else if they shared with you that they were having this sort of difficulty. You deserve the same kindness. So to be able to say to yourself, okay, yeah, I wish I hadn't done that. Tomorrow's another day. You know, I, I know I can do this. It's okay. You know, I don't need to be so hard on myself, be so mean to myself. I can, I can encourage myself. And self-compassion has actually been shown to be a better motivator for change than being self-critical. People think it's the opposite. Like if I push myself and I'm really hard on myself and I'm going to do greater things and, you know, go further, it's actually the opposite. That self-compassion, it's not being easy and soft on yourself. It's, it's allowing yourself to be human, make mistakes and, and keep on trying. Mm-hmm. So that would be a big one, I think. Um, another, another thing I would say if you're sort of battling your brain um, would be to try and, try and rewire some of the connections there. So a good way to start changing um, your outlook or how um, you, you know, your mood would be, so if you wake up in the morning and you wake up grumpy and all you're thinking about is the negative things ahead in your day, try to implement a practice of gratitude. So right then and there, try and think of if it's super hard, just even one thing that you're grateful for in that day that's coming up or that you're looking forward to, or it could just be like, yes, I get to have coffee, right? That could be it. You know, I also think doing gratitude at the end of the day is really good too, to sort of go to bed on a good note, thinking about, okay, what are a few things today that were little bright spots, you know, good things that I'm thankful for that can really change your, your brainscape. Because if you know, you're going to make yourself do it every day, you're going to be looking for those things Mm -hmm. instead of just highlighting for yourself the negative or the dark spots, right? So if you know that this is a practice I want to stick to, your brain is now starting to open up to, okay, look for the good, find the bright spots, because make note of those, notice those, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of just kind of only zoning in on the, the negative, because we, we all tend to do that, right? That's why news, yeah. news headlines are what they are. It's all yeah. negative. That's something I, I try and tell my followers as well, and people like Tim Ferriss, who's great for that. Um, there's a whole bunch, David Asprey, he's big on the positive. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, it's hugely important. And when I talk about anti-bullying with youth, you'll remember five negative things um, or all the negatives. And it takes five positives to try and get your brain out of thinking all those other negative things for the bullies, what the bullies do. Mm-hmm. And that's a very good points about, you know, waking up in the morning and noticing what's good, mm-hmm. positive about your life versus mm-hmm shit, I have to go to work. I fucking hate my job. I hate my boss. I have to take the goddamn bus, sit next to that stinky guy. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. I'm going to not like my work. I have to deal with Bob, who's a dick, who sits yeah. two cubicles over. And, you know, people get up in the morning, they think about this shit. Yeah. And uh, you're right. I think, you know, everyone listening, if you are one of those people that thinks negative all the time, we both want you to stop. <laughs> we both want you to start implementing positive thoughts in the morning and throughout the day to help change your thought pattern. Mm -hmm. And even if going straight to positivity is super hard, because some people I've seen, if they're really negative, it's really hard to go all the way to positive. So just start neutral, Mm -hmm. right? Just start with something, something that's not like, yay, this is going to be a great day. It's, you know, cause that might be too hard. So just start neutral with, you know, okay, today, you know, is, you know, it's Thursday and tomorrow's Friday and that's awesome. And the weekend's coming. Right. So it's not like overly positive. It's just kind of neutral, you know? Yeah. Um, so that, that can be sort of a starter. If, if you find that I just can't do positive yet, you'll get there, but maybe start neutral first. Baby steps. Exactly. <laughs> and I love how that one question, you know, who you are, who's listening to this, who probably asked that you just killed off like five other ones. 
<laughs> we've like nailed so many out right now. Um, let me go down. Oh, here's a big one. I get this from, I just had two, I guess, sit downs today with people who are just very, not unhappy with their life or happy with their life, but they don't feel like they've obtained or done anything substantial. Mm. And even though there's a lot of really good things going on in their life, they don't have a lot to complain about. They're so fixated on the fact that they're like 25 Mm -hmm. or 30 and they haven't done anything big yet. Okay. And like my response to that is you're fucking 25. Mm -hmm. Like you have a whole life ahead of you. Mm -hmm. Try new things, see what you're good at and just go hard at it. Like I quit my career at 27, Mm -hmm. um, which some people think is crazy, but what, what would you, if you're someone sitting down in front of you, and you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm 25. I haven't done anything substantial. I feel really guilt, guilty about that because my mom and dad are brain surgeons. You know, how, would you, how would you even try and fix that? Yeah, I think I would have a lot of questions for them. Like, what does, what does substantial mean? I think any question I ask you on here, you're going to have a lot of questions. To ask that yeah, yeah. There's, not, there's, there's no one simple answer. No. Yeah, yeah that's why people in therapy for so long because I would like that. Um, <laughs> No, I think I would ask them, you know, what, what does substantial need, mean and why is it important, right? What does your life mean if, if you know, it, it just you're doing what you're doing now and you're doing really well at it and, and there isn't this big, huge, you know, what is that, right? Is that, and is that for you or is that for how people perceive you, right? Yeah. Some people think that, in order for people to see me as worthy, worthwhile, valuable, I need to do something huge. And you're always, if that's, if you're doing it for other people, you're always going to be hustling for self-worth. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing it for yourself and what makes you content and make you feel, you know, satisfied, you're just doing, you're just doing what makes you happy and what makes you feel those things, not regardless of how people view it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's a big one, right? Is it for you? Is it for somebody else? Mm -hmm. Um, Because if it's for somebody else, I think you're never really going to catch that carrot, so to speak. Yeah. People are always going to expect more and more and more, right? Yeah. That's why going back to the relationships is having, you know, that partner, that spouse that supports you in what you want to do rather than, you know, that partner that's living for them, but then inside they're miserable Mm-hmm. And then you ask them like, "What's wrong?" Oh, nothing. But really, it's because you know they're caged up. Yeah, yeah. In their life. Yeah, yeah. That's awful. We already see, man. Like some of these questions just like obliterated a lot of the questions. Okay. But like I already answered those. Those are going to be like, "This is awesome." You answer all my questions. <laughs> I hope so. I okay so we'll go with this one as the last one because okay. I'm pretty sure we've obliterated the two pages of questions I have written down from from listeners and readers um this is a health and fitness one yep that I hear about all the time and I want to shake people sometimes is about their body image okay yeah body image is huge and yeah people can lose weight they're they have new pants their mm-hmm. inches are falling off, the body fat's going down, but they look in the mirror and they're still not good enough. Mm-hmm. And we see it with competitors too, like bodybuilders, man, post-comp, they are disasters because okay. they see this image on stage just being ripped. Mm-hmm. And four weeks later, they're not ripped anymore. Okay. Um, so I guess for competitors and for like normal people is the big self-image one. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So what are some steps we can get people that are having some challenges with their, with their image? Yeah, and I think I think that that idea of good enough is is the key there, right? Um, you know, feeling never never good enough. The way I look is never good enough. I can lose the weight. I can be down a few sizes, and still I'm not good enough. And sometimes it goes a little bit deeper than body image. Mm-hmm. Those things. Sometimes there's a little more, like digging into, you know, experiences you've had, what people have told you about yourself, and what makes you worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, there tends to sometimes be stuff there that, that plays into body image. Um, because I think the message is that we receive rather implicitly or explicitly we carry with us, right? Mm-hmm. Especially if they happen in our, our formative years. And another thing to, to think about with body image is, you know, 
I think for people, some people, body image defines my worth, defines my value. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's that's a really dangerous thing because as we age, as we change, you know, our bodies do do different things. They look differently. So to attach our self-worth and our value to something that's so, can be so transient and can be um, changing all the time, it means that our self-worth is very fragile. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that whole concept of good enough, I think needs to, needs to be anchored on something more solid, right. On, on the person that I am, the things I believe in, what I stand for, um, not just the outward things of what I've accomplished, you know, those big things or Mm -hmm. my body image. Um, so it's a hard body image is so hard because I think culturally we're taught that how you look on the outside is what determines your value and your worth. So yeah. you better look good or else everyone's going to see you as less than. Um, and so we got to fight against that. We've got to fight against, um, you know, messages like that, that maybe we received growing up from parents or other our friends, family, anybody. Right. So we have a lot going against us. And I I would say to anyone who's dealing with body image, you're definitely not alone in it. I would say, I would say probably everybody at some point has had some negative feeling or concern about the way that they looked at some point in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. Um, And if they haven't, wow, that's, that's really incredible. Um, So, you know, it, it, it can be changed. You can work towards, you know, getting that feeling of, of good enough. Um, But it's hard work. And it would, might require a bit of digging into, into what makes me valuable, what gives me my worth, right? Because everybody's born with worth. We're all worthy individuals. But then along the way, we start to tack on prerequisites to it, right? And we start to chip yeah. away at it. I'm only worthy if I'm a size two. I'm only worthy if I have that job. I'm only with, right? So, and so with body image or any other issue that makes you feel not good enough, it might be a... Um, a process of looking at what are some of those prerequisites that I tacked on to my self-worth that made me feel that I'm not good enough if I'm not a size two or if I look this certain way or if I'm not ripped, right? And how do I go about anchoring that self-worth to something that's more, um, more stable than, mm-hmm. than say body image. Um, so that's, kind of how I look at it, but it's, it's hard. It's extremely hard. And we yeah. talk about it. It sounds so simple. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's so hard and it takes a long time uh, sometimes to, to sort of work through some of these issues. So people that feel frustrated that they've been trying, 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 and still not feeling they're there yet. That's okay. It takes a long time and mm-hmm. it's really, really hard work. The fact that you're aware of it and working on it is the first step and that's that's a great thing that you're there instead of just totally unaware yeah and i think society is not helping out with if you go to the grocery store and then there's these magazines with these fitness models that are photoshopped to shit Mm. and then you're like oh that's the ideal body type that's what i should look like right and then you know you see commercials and tv and you see you know shit all over facebook and it's just like this constant compounding effect of what you oh, should yeah. look like, thanks yeah. to, in my opinion, bullshit media. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's everyone's an individual, and everyone. This might sound so cliche and nerdy, but like everyone's <laughs> perfect in their own way because none of us is. Yeah, yeah exactly. We all have um, to offer. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, and some people look at me and they make comments all, "You can't complain because you're fit." Well, I've been an athlete nearly my entire life. And I did get chunky at one time. Like <laughs> I did after, I think it was after high school, actually. Put on some beef, whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you saw my baby pictures, I look like a little sumo wrestler. I, was, <laughs> I had like fat rolling over my knees. It was, it was awesome. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I think staying away from media and all the bullshit hype is a good idea. I know mm-hmm. I don't pay attention to it. Mm-hmm. Um, comparison, yeah, comparison is a thief of joy, right? I don't know who said that, but it's one of my favorite it's brilliant. quotes, right? Because <laughs> it's so true. When we start comparing, we essentially rob ourselves of the joy that we have of our of our lives and our own selves. That's I think that is going to be the highlight of this podcast. That exa- like I love what you just said. <laughs> it's just so true. Yeah, yeah, it is. We can be completely satisfied, and then we start. We hop on social media. We look at, oh, look what they have, look what they're doing, and it starts to slowly chip away at, at our happiness and our joy. Right? It just yeah. robs it. 
which is why I also don't watch enough news because it's all negative. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even touch the news anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess in closing, how can people, I mean, if they're in the Ottawa area, I'm assuming, um, mm-hmm. how can they get a hold of you if they're, if they've taken this podcast to heart and they're like, you know what, I think it'd be great if I took that step to pick up that phone. Yeah. yeah. How can they do that? How can they find you? So um, the easiest way is probably my website. Um, so it's uh, robertsontherapy.ca. Um, so there's myself and, uh, and my colleague, Kylie. So we operate the practice together. So either one of us will um, get in touch with you. So a lot of people choose to either fill out the contact form or email. If that seems less scary, that's totally fine. If mm-hmm. calling maybe is hard, because I know some people calling is really is a, yeah. is a barrier. So you don't have to call. You can send an email. Um, and then we'll get back to you and we'll chat about, you know, if you have questions about therapy in general, like what, what can I expect? What might the first session look like? We're happy to answer any of those questions. Um, so yeah, our website's probably the easiest way to awesome. touch with us. Cool. I will also have that in case you guys are wondering, all that information will be on the podcast. So if you go down to the information, it'll all be there. Um, so if you guys want to get in touch with Mandy, um, or her practice, feel free to email, like she just said. Call them. I think you guys should all pick up the phone. That is the takeaway from this one is pick up the damn phone. Uh, But thank you for coming on the podcast and uh, talking about depression. I know it's not an easy topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. And for those of you listening, please leave a comment, like, share for those who think that would need this podcast, need to hear or get a little uplift or some help. And that's what this uh, this podcast is for. So thank you again uh, for coming on and thank you to listeners for listening to this episode. And until next week, we're going to go now and get some shit done just like you guys should. <laughs> but we'll uh, see you guys. I won't even see you. I'm on a podcast. I don't see shit. But we'll, we'll get you guys listen to me next week. <laughs> Contact Mandy if you need some help. <laughs>